Welcome to part three of our uh, series here called This Is Us. And every single March, we come together as a family across all of our campuses. And what we do is that we want to reinvigorate our values um, here at Destiny. And we just believe that it is values, as I taught last week, that drives vision. And you can have vision, but you need values in order for that to get, uh, uh, to, for that vision to come to pass. So we're going to get into it. Are you ready to get into God's Word? Come on, can you stand and give our online audience a big, big, big round of applause. God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much for watching. Our theme verse, our theme verse for the month is Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. It says, you therefore will be perfect, growing into spiritual maturity both in mind and character, actively integrating godly values into your daily life. And so the more you're maturing in Christ, the more God is actively working his values inside of you. And he says, as your heavenly father is perfect. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation and give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never, never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen. You may be seated. If you have a message outline, our ushers will be more than happy to get you one. We've been in this series, and we're talking about our values, and we learned last week that it is values that actually drive vision. And so every one of us has a vision for our lives. We have a vision for our careers. We have a vision for our families. But oftentimes, if you want to see where vision gets derailed, it's easy to go back and you can trace it somewhere that someone lost some values. When a company derails, it goes off, it's because primarily they went off from their values. When a marriage derails, it's usually because the values have been compromised. And so the reason why we take this month every year is because in January, we're talking about vision, we're talking about focus, we're talking about brand new beginnings, we're talking about goals and dreams. But none of that will ever get accomplished if you don't take a step back and evaluate your values. And at Destiny, we have values that drive this vision. And last week I talked about it. The first thing is that God is our source. Everything begins with Him. In other words, we learned last week that God is our source and everything else is our, it's our resource. And then we talked about that Jesus is our message. In other words, we believe his life was given for our freedom. And so, so it is God's desire when he sent Jesus that you would live in total freedom. And today I'm going to talk to you, which is one of my favorites, is the Holy Spirit is our guide. In other words, his direction leads us in every decision. And then prayer is our priority. Prayer is our first response not our last resort. We believe that generosity is our privilege. Giving our time, talent, and treasure is a blessing, come on somebody, and not a burden. We believe that honor is our attitude. We lift others up and we never tear them down. We believe humility is our posture, which means we're never too big to do the small things. And then lastly, holiness is our lifestyle. We live to glorify God in all that we do. People often ask me, what kind of church is destiny? You know, now 16 years of age, three campuses, growing. I always go, Destiny's a church of steps. We just believe that every week you just get committed to taking one more step closer to God. And 52 weeks later, you will look back and you will see that you're 52 steps closer to your destiny and further from your history. You know, in other words, we believe, our, we believe that our steps are what we do, but our values reveal why we do them. And today what I want to talk to you is our third value. And I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you because he is here today. You know, the Bible talks about it. The Bible says that when God created the heavens and the earth, in Genesis 1, it says, and God created the heavens and the earth. One of the first things that God did was he introduced himself as a creative God. But it was just not God, the Father. It was Elohim. It was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The three that are in one. People sit there and they say, but I, I don't quite understand that. Well, think about an egg. You have an egg white, you have an egg yolk, and you have an egg shell. 
That's an egg. Three components, but one. When God created man, he created man in his image. He didn't create a dog. He didn't create a cat, didn't create a tree. No, he created man in his image. And if God is one and three and three and one, so are you and I. We are spirit, we are soul, and we are body. And so as, the, as God the Father walked with the prophets, walked with Moses, spoke to Jeremiah, walked with Isaiah, and then one day Jesus steps on the scene and now he's in ministry and today and, that, and at that time, Jesus was walking with the disciples. It wasn't God. God was communicating through Jesus. But it was Jesus on earth walking with the disciples. One day, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, Hey, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send another one. Jesus went back to the right hand of the Father. God is still seated on the throne. But today, the Holy Spirit is here on earth. So just like... The prophets walked with God. The disciples walked with Jesus. You and I as believers get to walk with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to guide us. In John chapter 16, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own, but will tell you what he heard, and he will tell you about your future. And every one of us, that knows that God has a future for our lives. We know that according to Jeremiah 29, 11, that our future is good. We know that God is the alpha. He's the beginning. He's also the end, which means he has our future all wrapped in it together for us. Oftentimes, where we get lost is in the journey. And the Holy Spirit is introduced as our guide. You know, a few months ago, we were away with my kids, and we got on one of those buses. And while we were riding on that bus, the, the, we were headed towards the destination that we paid the bus to take us to. And there were all kinds of other people on there, but the, the tour guide there had a microphone over his head. And I'm just sitting there thinking he's going to tell us, you know, he's going to speak, you know, not that much, but, but he just kept on talking the whole time. I mean, I wanted to tell him, like, man, you need to kind of slow down a little bit. But he would say, look to the right, there's that. Look to the left, there's there. Look up ahead, there's that. And he'd go, we're 10 minutes away from our destination. But if you will look over here, it's that. And if you'll look back there, it's this. We are five minutes away from our destination. After a while, it reminded me, he's like the Holy Spirit. See, at the end of the day, when you're going places you've never been before, when God begins to promote your life, and God begins your dreams and aspirations, just like everything, God shows your destination, but he doesn't show your process on how you're going to get there. So you need the reassurance of the Holy Spirit reminding you that as you're going and you're looking around and you're saying, God, this doesn't look like what you showed me. The Holy Spirit, who's your guide, is telling you, it's okay, look to the right, you're going to enjoy this. Look to the left, you're going to enjoy that. We're just five days away from the destiny that I have for your life. Oftentimes, what happens is, is that we push the guide away. You know, I love traveling with some guys sometimes. Prior to GPS, you would know when someone was lost. And the guys, we'd be like, come on, pull over, dude. Like, let's just go to the gas station. Let's just ask where, where, where it's at. Nah, I know where I'm going. I know exactly where I'm going. No, you don't know where you're going because you've never been. God told Abraham in Genesis 12, I'm going to show you the place I'm taking you. God was able to show him because God was there. It took faith for Abraham to go somewhere he's never gone before. And when, you, when you're doing that, when it comes to your career, when it comes to you stepping out in faith, when it comes to you going through something that's causing a setback but really preparing you for a comeback, is the fact that you need the Holy Spirit to remind you you're in the right place. See, the word guide means a person who assists someone in travel to reach a destination, an unfamiliar area by journeying with them and giving them directions to that individual. See, John describes him like this. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, who's also your comforter, your advocate, your intercessor, your counselor, your strengthener, he's the one standing by you. 
It's the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name and in my place to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things, not some things. Let's say it, all things. Say it again, all things. And he will help you remember everything that I have told you. So everything you've ever heard about God, the Holy Spirit has a way of bringing it back to remembrance. Reminding you, no, this is what I promised you. No, this is what, this is what I'm going to give you. This is what I'm showing you. The question you got to ask yourself is this. Why is the Holy Spirit so misunderstood? Why isn't it God or Jesus? But why is it the Holy Spirit that somewhat divides the church? Oh, well, this church, man, they're really excited. They must be charismatics. Well, this church, it's kind of quiet. Man, maybe they're Presbyterians. Yeah, this church, they kind of they operate in gifts. Oh, maybe they're charismaniacs. Oh, man, these people, they're kind of quiet, but they'll pray for you. Maybe they're Bapticostals. It's amazing that we have all these slices of what we call the church. And really the divider is not God because they all believe it, that God is Father. They all believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But what divides a church is the Holy Spirit. People get confused. They think he's goosebumps or he's fire or wind or oil. Yet the devil has done a masterful job in confusing the church when it comes to who the Holy Spirit is. See, in order to understand why he's misunderstood, you got to go all the way back. You and I have an enemy. He's our adversary. And the Bible speaks of the devil like this. He says, he has always hated the what? Come on, say it like you mean it. Because there is no truth. In him. In other words, when he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and he is the father of lies. So when, the, so when you hear this little voice inside of you saying, you're not good enough, that's not God because God doesn't make mistakes. Oh, you're never going to make it. No, that's not God because he promised you that if he began a work in your life, he's going to be faithful to complete it in your life. Oh, but pastor, you know, man, I, I, I'm, I'm not good enough. Oh, no, no, no. You're not, you're not just good enough. You're more than enough. You got everything what it takes for God to take you to where exactly you need to be. And so the thing is, come on, I'll just keep on going. And the thing is, you got me a mic? Got a new board. Praise God for the new board. And the thing is, is that the Holy Spirit, I mean, the, the enemy, he's a liar. And here's why. He hates the what? Come on, say it. He hates the what? And he hates the truth because there is no truth in him. So everything he tells you is a lie. When you wake up and you're worried about tomorrow because, oh, my God, you're going to go through all this kind of stuff, it's the devil lying to you because he cannot tell you the truth. When you wake up in fear and you're walking in anxiety because you got a bad report from the doctor, you got to go back to what the truth says. And the truth says, I'm the God that heal it thee today. Why? He's just trying to put fear inside of you. And so, so the question you got to ask is that if he hates the truth, then who is truth? What is truth? The Bible describes it to us in John 14. It says, and Jesus told him, I am the way and I am the what? So wait a minute. Truth is not an it. Truth is not a fact. Truth is a what? It's a person. And his name is what? Come on, and his name is what? His name is Jesus. So Jesus stood up one day and says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I am the life, and no one gets to the Father except through what? Through me. And so if it is your goal every day to go to your Father, the only way you can go to your Father is through Christ. And who is Jesus? He is the what? Come on, he is the what? Come on, say it again. He is the what? And so when the devil hates the truth, he hates Jesus. 
And he wants you to can be confused about what Jesus says, what Jesus did, because he ultimately does not want you to get to the Father. So if the devil hates truth, and truth is Jesus, then what is the Holy Spirit's job? So he knew, well, man, I tried to kill Jesus, but I couldn't. Because on the third day, he rose from the grave. So there goes that. I had my chance, but what I can do is I can confuse you about the Holy Spirit because the devil hates truth, Jesus is the truth, but look at the Holy Spirit's responsibility. Why did God send him? When the Spirit of truth comes, come on, let's all say this, one more, one, two, three, he will guide you into all truth. Say it again. He will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit's not going to guide you into a lie. He's not going to guide you into doubt. He's not going to guide you into fear. He's not going to guide you into anxiety. He's not going to he's not going to guide you into worry. He's only going to guide you to one place and that one place only and that one person only is called what? It's called truth. And so at the end of the day, the reason why the devil tries to get the church all bent out of shape because of the Holy Spirit is because he knows if he can confuse the church on the Holy Spirit, in whom the responsibility of the Holy Spirit is to guide people to Jesus, then we can have a worship service, we can come to a building, and we can never get to Jesus. And so at the end of the day, we got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because his job is not to raise your arms on your head. Well, I don't have any, but on your arm. His job, his job is not to give you goosebumps. His job, no, no, his job is one reason and one reason only. I'm going to lead you to truth. I'm going to take you to truth. When you get bad news, I'm going to lead you to truth. Come on, when a storm is coming against you, I'm going to lead you into truth. Come on, when all hell is coming against you, I'm going to lead you into all truth. That's the Holy Spirit. It's what he does. And so the enemy goes, oh, let me, let me. Let me confuse the church about him. So we are now understand why he's misunderstood, but then the question is, who is he? I'd like to know who is he. The first thing is that he's my inner voice. See, John 16 says this, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. See, most of you, when you hear that word conviction, you, 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 you think of this. No, he, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. God doesn't condemn you. Convicts you. Conviction is just that inner voice that tells you there's a little bit something better. Don't settle for that. Man, when you're going in some direction, or maybe you fall into sin, and you're like, man, I messed up, Pastor Obed, man, I messed up. The Bible says a righteous man will fall seven times, but he just gets himself right back up. But you try to beat yourself, I'm just, I'm just, an, I mean, I'm no good, I can't believe I did this. That's not conviction, that's condemnation. God doesn't condemn. Come on, he what? Convicts. He's that inner voice inside of you. He says, come on, don't do that. You're better than that. Everything inside of you going, man, I just want to, I want to retaliate. And that inner voice says, vengeance is going to be mine. Don't worry about it. Conviction is different than condemnation. He's my inner voice. The Bible says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by what? The Holy Spirit. The second thing the Holy Spirit is, who he is, is that he's my teacher. The Bible says in John 14, he says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you some things. No, it teaches you what? Come on, he teaches you what? And he will remind you of everything I have ever said to you. And so at the end of the day, when you sit there and you're on your journey towards success and you're on your journey towards the abundance that God has for you, the dreams that he has for you, you're going to get to a place called stuck. And you're going to get to that place, and you're going to sit there, and you're going to come to church one day, and you're going to go like, you know what, man? i got to be honest with you, ma'am. I am what? I'm stuck. 
And when you're stuck, you get frustrated. Man, you just sit there and you go, God, you told me to start this journey. I believe that you would get me there. The truth is, is that it's never if you're going to get there. It's always when are you going to get there. But what's more importantly is who are you going to be when you get there. You see, through the journey, God takes you from one step after the other. Think about David. David one day is in the back of the fields, and he has his slingshot. He's getting some rocks, hitting some trees, you know, playing some, 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 some games with, with, with his sheep. And all of a sudden, his dad whistles, and he's like, son, you got to go take lunch to your brothers. His brothers were the generals of the army. They were high and mighty. They were big. They were masculine. They were good. Remember, David was overlooked. He wasn't even the first choice. He wasn't even the second choice. Matter of fact, he wasn't even the third choice. He was the last choice. I love how God turns the last into first. And just because you're overlooked by man doesn't mean you're overlooked by God. Come on, somebody, right? And so, and so all of a sudden, here comes David with his little lunch pill, and he got his lunch for his brothers. And, and, and he looks at his brothers, and they're like, and he's like, what's wrong with you guys? And his brother looks at him and says, dude, look. Look at that big old giant. His name's Goliath. Guy's like nine foot tall. He killing everybody. And, and, and little David, he, you know, 17-year-old little kid, he's like, Got a little slingshot in the back of his pocket. He got his lunch pill. Brings some, he, 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 he brings some filet of fish or whatever, right? And, and he's like, oh, I'll kill him. You know, just like a, you know, you know when them little kids that one day they act like they hard and stuff like that? You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? And then like they, you know, they just talking trash, right? You're like, man, shh, be quiet. I could just imagine his brother's like, boy, you better be quiet. He's like, man, I'll, I'll knock that brother out. Don't you know who I am? I could just imagine David getting that crip walk, right? Like, yeah, you don't know why. You don't know who I am, right? You know, coming and strolling, right? And so, and so, so David goes, well, what do we get if we kill him? Oh, well, the reward is that you, you don't have to pay taxes. Neither does your family. He's like, oh, that's cool. I don't care about that. Oh, here's a big one. You get the king's daughter. He's like, oh, yes. So David has the courage, unlike everybody else who's skilled in warfare, to go kill Goliath. So Saul goes, here, take my armor. And David, out of courtesy, goes, oh, okay, I'll wear it. And David puts it on, and it doesn't fit. It's incredible because the lesson is, is that you can't use someone else's armor to fight your battles. Come on, there's going to be a time you're going to have to grow up. And it got to be your prayers and not just your mama's prayers. Hello, somebody, right? And so David goes and he kills Goliath. And everyone's blown away. They're like, oh, my God, hashtag OMG. Man, look what happened. He killed Goliath. But the only one that wasn't shocked was David. See, it's not always what the Bible says. Often it's what the Bible doesn't say. Like the Bible doesn't, it never mentioned that his brothers who were great in the skill of war never defeated a lion, never killed a bear by its own hands. But see, every fight was building his faith for another giant. And so when David defeated the lion, he got a faith, like he had some courage. And the next thing you know, a, a bear comes to attack his sheep, and he's like, oh, I could kill this bear. Well, how can you kill this bear? Because I killed this lion over here. And so because he had the confidence of faith that God fights his battles with him, he defeated the lion. He defeated the bear. And so when he showed up and he saw this nine-foot man, he looked at him and says, who? Who messes with the children of Israel like this? Who do you think you are? And his brother's like, dude, you need to chill. 
chill, be quiet, don't say anything. And he's like, boy, I'll knock that brother out. How are you going to knock him out? Because the same God that helped me defeat a lion, the same God that helped me defeat a bear, is the same God, come on, that's going to deliver me and kill that Philistine in Jesus' name. See, every single step is building your faith for the next giant that you're facing. You're facing a giant today that's a different size than the giant you faced last year. And the reason why is because the giant today is not bigger than the faith that's inside of you. And so at the end of the day, the Holy Spirit, he reminds you, I'm your teacher. I'm teaching you all things. I'm going to take you places no eyes have seen and no ear has heard. See, the Bible says, but you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you what? Everything you need to know. The third thing is that he's my guide. He's my guide. The Bible says this. It says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. Now, I want you to get your outlines out, get your, get your, get your notepads, get your, get, get your pens ready. Because here's, here's, here, here's what I want you to circle. Because late at night, when you wake up in the next few weeks or whatever, you may even be tomorrow, and you're like, oh, God, I got this fear. Or, oh, my God, anxiety is knocking on my door. Oh, my God. No, no, no. I want you to circle this. Ready? We'll start here. One, two, three. He will speak only what he hears. Come on, say it again. He will speak only what he hears. Say it again. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Now, here's where I want to park at just for one minute. What does it mean that he will only speak what he hears? It's because the Holy Spirit is on earth. And the one who speaks is on the throne. So when you're at bed at night and you're sleeping, God and the Holy Spirit are having a conversation about you. This is why when you wake up in the morning, you turn on your, put on your candle, you turn on worship music, you open up your Bible and you're like, yes, that's for me. Man, that's word speaking to me. That's it. I'm going to take that and I'm going to take that word too. And the Holy Spirit is orchestrated everything because at the end of the day, he only speaks to you what has been told by him. So oftentimes you're sitting there and you're going, I just feel like I'm stuck and I don't feel no, I don't have nowhere to go. And I don't know, God, where are you? And God's like, where am I? I'm right here. Yeah, but God, you're not saying anything. He goes, oh, no, I'm speaking. You're just not listening. Because at the end of the day, I'm having conversations about you. And the Holy Spirit wants to tell you, but you've been tuning him out. You've been listening to every other noise that is out there except his voice. Man, when the Holy Spirit says something, when you, I was in a meeting this past week, and I, and I was sitting in Denver, and I was in this meeting, and, 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 and all of a sudden it was quiet, and, and, and the guys were speaking. I was, was kind of saying, I was just quiet. And I, I just, just be still and know that I'm God. Be still, obey, and know that I'm God. Be still, obey, and know that I'm God. And, and while everyone's mouths were moving, my ears got bigger. And I tuned out of the conversation that was here because I was trying to hear from there. And the Spirit of the Lord said something. Boom. And I said, man, can I, can I share something? And when I shared it, the room just got quiet. The Father talked to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit told me what heaven wanted to say. Come on, are you hearing me? So when you hear that still, small voice inside of you, go this way. Don't do that. Make sure 
you do this. Stay clean. Don't retaliate. When you hear that little still small voice, the Holy Spirit, he's telling you, don't repay evil with evil. No, no, no. Don't. You, no, I'll fight your battles for you. No, no. You know, you, you know what that voice is saying? It is speaking because it heard a voice from heaven called the Father. And the Father saying, I want my child to know that everything's going to be okay. Come on, are you, come on, are you with me today? See, at the end of the day, he's our, he's our guide. So, so the Holy Spirit, who is now in me, the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, don't grieve God. Don't break his heart, his Holy Spirit. Moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Here's what grieving the Holy Spirit means. Here's what it means. I, I've heard it my whole life in church. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm like, okay, tell me what it means. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay, I wish, I wish you would tell me what it means. Okay, here's what it means. We know why he's misunderstood. Because he's the one that guides you into all truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus has all the answers for your life. And the one who hates the truth is called the what? The devil. So here's what grieving the Holy Spirit means. This is why God, this is when God says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Here's why. He says, you've listened to a lie when I've sent you the truth. Can I break it down? When I was growing up, my mother would look at me and say, those friends are not good for you. And I'm like, Mom, come on. How could you say that? You don't know my friends. You're not with them. I'm with them all the time. And Mom, like, they're going to lead you in the wrong direction. And I'm like, Mom, come on. Don't say that. You got to like my friends. Come on, parents. Come on. You, you use what you tell your kids, right? And then here's what happened. My mom who gave birth to me, my mom who fed me, my mom who raised me, here came a friend in my life for a year. And here's what grieved my mom. What grieved my mom was, you're listening to him when I've been in your life the whole time. Don't you think I know the best for you? And when, the, when we grieve the Holy Spirit, it's God saying, I've been with you from the beginning. I would just wish you would listen to me instead of the lies that are out there trying to convince you of something else. That's what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. My mom, she couldn't stop me. Just like God, he won't stop you but he will meet you at the place of your brokenness. And my mom didn't condemn me. Oh, bed, I told you. She never did that. She just says, mijo. Come on, you know what mama say, mijo. <laughs> you know you in good standings. When I would get in trouble, she'd be like, oh, bet George Martinez. You know you in trouble. You about to get spanked. But when mom said, mijo, you're like, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> mijo. Just don't make that mistake again. That's, the, that's what it means. So what does it mean, Pastor Obed, the Holy Spirit being in me? The first thing we ought to do every day is ask the Holy Spirit to show me as I close. The Bible says in Psalms 92, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of the everlasting. God, show me. Every day I wake up, Lord, show me. Allow me to see where you're taking me. Give me an understanding of what's happening in my life. I get an email coming in from L.A., and I get an email on my phone, and it's the disciplinarian in chief at my son's school. My son's 10 years old. He's kind of he's changing. He's becoming um, respectfully disobedient. And... And uh, he's kind of, you know, messing with the waters a little bit. And, and so, so, you know, the disciplinarian in chief wanted to meet with us. 
And so I walk in with my son. We have a meeting. I can tell my son's a little nervous. And I said, son, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. And the discipline in chief starts naming all these things. And, and I said, well, son, uh, did you hear what the disciplinarian in chief said? Yeah, dad. Well, do you, do you feel bad? Well, of course. Are you going to change? Yes. Okay. But I knew he was just going through the motion. He was like, get me out of here. My son being 10 and I forgot what it's like to be 10. I used to love giving him high fives. There's moments I want to give him a back five. Come on, all you parents say amen to that, right? But you just don't want CPS knocking on your door. And so my, so I get in my car and I'm driving back to the office and I put worship music on. I say, Holy Spirit, show me. Show me what's, you created him. You knitted him while he was in his mother's womb. I don't know him the way you do. Show me. That night we were in the house and he was sitting at the table watching a movie. He was eating some snacks. I went and sat next to him and I said, hey, son, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, who else at school are you hanging around with that's not your best friends? And he goes, oh, well, no, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm just hanging around with these guys. I said, no, son, is, is there anybody else? He goes, well, yeah, yeah, there's been one. And I'm like, oh, okay, what's his name? And so he starts, yeah, well, his name is this. I said, can I ask you a question? He's like, what? And I'm like, um, does he say, like, bad language? He looked at me, he goes, yeah, he, 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 he does sometimes, Dad. I said, tell me about him. And I could see where my son's getting uncomfortable. And I looked at him. I said, the only reason why I'm asking is because when I left today, I got in the car and I turned worship music on and I said, Holy Spirit, show me what's happening to my son. Who's influencing him right now? Because I know this isn't you. And I said, so I just kind of want to let you know that that's what my mom did to me. And so I'm just going to give you kind of like a heads up. Is that like God talks to me and I talk to God and we actually talk about you? Come on, how many know this is worse than a spanking, right? And then I, I, I said, I, I kind of just want you to know that he going to tell me some things. So I'm going to let you know right now, you ain't going to get away with nothing. Just always come to me and tell me the truth and I, I'll be cool with that. But the day you lie to me, son, you're going to see a dent somewhere on your body. You know what I'm joking? And ever since that day, my son, he's just sensitive as he is. Holy Spirit, show me. Man, maybe you're not with your kids sometimes and they're being influenced and they come with attitude. No, instead of, no, 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 go to your prayer closet and say, Holy Spirit, show me. Show me what's happening. He reveals it. The second thing is, Holy Spirit, change me. Change me. The Bible says this, for the, Lord, for, the, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, come on, let's say it, there is what? There's freedom. That God wants you to live with freedom. Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, change me. And then lastly, number three, Holy Spirit, fill me. God, fill me with your love every day. Fill me with your joy every day. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. No, instead, be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? I, I grew up in church where they're like, you need to be drunk in the Spirit. I'm like, how do you do that? Like, I, don't, I don't understand what that means. Really what the writers are saying is that they're giving a comparison, a metaphor that that being drunk causes you to do things out of the normal. When you are filled with the Spirit, he's referring to that it causes you to do things outside of the normal. In other words, being filled with the Spirit and somebody takes a jab at you, the normal thing to do is 
take a jab right back. But out of the normal allows you to turn your cheek. Come on, somebody, right? Man, when you get bad news, the normal thing to do is to panic and, and have paranoia and have fear. But when you're filled with the Spirit, come on, you act outside of the ordinary. In other words, you know that there's a God that controls your destiny and that a disease does not have that final date on your life, but only the one who has given that life to you in Jesus' name. So why, God, do I want to be filled with the Spirit? Is because I want to act outside of the ordinary. When somebody says something bad about me, I'm not going to say something bad about them. I'm going to repay evil with good. Man, when, 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 when something comes against me, I'm not going to panic. I'm going to be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to act outside of the ordinary. People are going to look at you and they're going to say, man, look what's happening in your life. You should be stressed out. You should be wondering. Man, you should be full of doubt. But guess what? You're filled with the Holy Spirit inside of your life and you are acting outside, come on, of the ordinary in Jesus' name. But this is what I love. That this, this is what the church has to understand. That being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It actually makes me better than me. That I am different when I have the Holy Spirit. Come on, I'm more than a conqueror when I have the Holy Spirit. Come on, I'm in tune with God when I have the Holy Spirit. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Come on, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. I'm a heritage of the Lord. I have his inheritance over my life. If God is for me, come on, who can be against me? Because I know that God is on my side he's my victor he's my helper he's my comforter he's my all in all he's my everything because I have the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus name come on you want to shout and give God a praise this morning come on you ought to stand to your feet Maybe this week you say, Pastor Obed, I've gone through some stuff. I've gotten some bad news to my body. Man, the doctors are saying this. The doctor's saying that. I'm here to let you know that fear not for the Lord is with you. Come on, if he's the author of your life, he's the finisher of your life. Come on, there's not a disease. Cancer can't take your life. Only Jesus can take your life. You say, Pastor Obed, I had a setback in my job. Well, every setback prepares you for a comeback. If God closed the door, it's because he has a bigger door waiting for you on the other side. You ought to walk in faith. Come on, you ought to walk in victory because God has already settled it in Jesus' name. Boy, you shouldn't have given me a mic because I want to preach now. Listen, I do this often in my home. When I get up at 4.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, I go get my cup of coffee, put on worship music on and study my Bible and and you know I love to pray more than I love to preach it's something my mom it was on my mom's life she was an intercessor and I love to, to to pray and but there's often times when I'm going through something and I'm not hearing clear see where there's clarity there's prosperity where there's clutter it feels like you're in the gutter and your mind gets cluttery sometimes and often when I feel like there's clutter, I do what Jesus did one day. Jesus walked up to a deaf man that couldn't hear, put his, his hands, his fingers on his ear. And the Bible says that man who was deaf could now hear. And there's times when I'm going through a season in my life and I'm hearing all this other noise and it's trying to rob my thinking. It's trying to consume my mind that I just put my ears, my hand on my ears, and I say, Holy Spirit, open my ears to hear what you are saying. I don't want to hear the peripheral. 
I want to hear the spiritual. I want to hear what you're saying. Because I can face that when I have a reassurance here. I just need to know everything's going to be all right. I would love to lay hands on your ears, but it's the coronavirus. No, I'm joking. So I'm going to allow you, I'm going to tell you to put your own ears, your own hands on your ears. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will open your ears to hear. Father, I thank you for every person who has their hands on their ear. That, Lord, you show us in your word, you open up ears. Lord, we want to open up our ears to the voice of the Holy Spirit our teacher, our guide, our comforter, our advocate. The one who stands by us. We want to be sensitive to what he's saying because we know that he only speaks what heaven has said. He doesn't speak his own agenda. He doesn't speak his own thing. He only speaks what he has heard. God, we want to know what you're saying about everything in our life. And we want to know that we're on the right path towards the right direction, headed towards the destiny that you have for us. I anoint every ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is declaring. I anoint business ears that they would get insight and foresight, that they would have wisdom beyond their years, that they would have the spirit of understanding. I pray for ears that are in boardrooms, ears that are in in offices, ears that are in the marketplace, ears that are in the education system, ears that are in the hospitals, ears that are out there, God. I thank you that you're whispering to us and you're giving us an advantage. The Holy Spirit the anointing you're giving us insight you're giving us foresight in Jesus name we thank you that we have the confidence that heaven is talking about us in the mighty name of Jesus come on and all God's people say amen come on you want to clap like you know come on you're going to be sensitive to God listen with your head bowed and your eyes closed You're here today and you say, Pastor Obed, I don't have a relationship with God and I don't know if something would ever happen to me. I don't have the assurance that I'd be in heaven today. If you're here today and you say, would you include me in this prayer? I just want to know that I'm right with God. If that's you today, on the count of three, the Spirit of the Lord is here. I just want you to lift your hands. One, two, three. Just lift them up wherever they're at. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on. You ought to clap because people are giving their lives to Jesus right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. See, this is God. See, that what caused you to lift your hand was the connection of God. He was just saying there's something better. There's something better for your life. There's something better. Come on, you raised your hand all alone, and it's the last time you have to do it because now you're going to be part of this spiritual family. Amen. Come on, would you say this prayer? Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Thank you that I'm washed by the blood, that I don't have a past anymore because you wiped it all away. Today, my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm securing my place in heaven because I'm saved and I'm born again. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you that you rose from the grave. And thank you that you're coming back again for me. But from this day forward, I want to be your disciple and follow you all the days of my life. I am born again, filled with the Spirit, and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, come on, and all God's people say amen. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus.